industrious people, we produce a lot of, um, like for instance, we had uh, the first black Miss Universe in the world. And we, we, actually we had more than one, I think. We had like two or three or something like that. But we had a lot of first, we had a lot of first in a lot of stuff. It, it, and that's really um, a thing that in the African diaspora, you have that good Africans are first in a lot of things. There's a lot of things that white guys come in after. They, they just bring up to the end, you know. They bring up, they're always bringing up the end. Usain Bolt first, for example. He's a first. All the rest of them, like, they have to follow him, you know. So Trinidad itself, um, was not uh, uh, obscure or or left back in any way. We always was at the front <coughs> of the line, you know. We all the, the island itself. We, I'm not um, pinpointing any one person. We was always at the first of the line. We produce a lot of good stuff. We, we have a lot of good. We still produce a lot of good stuff today. You know what I'm saying? We still have, we hand on the trigger, so to speak. We still in, in the game, you know, we're not out of the game. Uh, but you, no, nowadays, with the, with the atmosphere the way it is, people are starting to um, come alive because the younger people in the island is starting to grow in intelligence. They don't want to be they, they all want to be entrepreneurs, for, for example. They don't want to work for nobody. They, we all want to start our own businesses. And those of us who went before doing that, um, now, now they're starting to, uh, like, like the steel pan. You know the steel pan, right? Mm -hmm. right. We don't have a, pan fac a, a, a factory in Trinidad making this stuff. So they have to, in Americans, they make pans in America. Mm -hmm. Now that's the only instrument that was developed and invented in the 20th century. And the, re the, the way that come about is was like uh, in 1945, the government imposed a ban on African drums, when you know, pan drums. They had a ban on that because Africans used to play that all the time, and you know, like Barbados, they have what they call cup, cup over, which is a remnant from when harvest time is over, you get together and have a big celebration in the street, you know. And same thing with Trinidad, we, we just call it carnival. They, they're so bold. These people are very bold. They take over that and say it has French influence. That's what the French used to do. But what I think was happening was that we used to mimic the French people with the way they dress and the way they speak and the little umbrellas and you, you know what I'm saying and walk around with the three piece suits and <laughs> we used to mimic that like like it was a joke and that catch on <coughs> and it become uh, carnival. We have a thing we call juve early two o'clock in the morning. It starts. On, it's always on a Sunday, Monday, and a Tuesday. So at two o'clock in the morning, it would start the band. It's the, the steel band grow from from you know, um, you hang it around your neck. But before that, what I was telling about the um, the drum, the government banned the use of the instrument. So you know, Africans are very inventive. You, you can't take that give that up to yourself. You invent everything. Somebody decided to take a steel drum that oil used to be here. That's where they shipped oil. And turn it on its on its on its on its bottom. Sink the center down and play it one note. Right? That's what they used to do. And that's how they and they start playing the steel part. And it, it developed over the years. You know, you, you start having some guys uh, 
Sono da Capiano, una little tune in Boston. You know, he put up a make, make it like sound like an instrument. So now you have these bands start to grow from three, four guys to massive amounts of people in a, in a, in a in one band. You know, you should you should look it up sometime, you know, and see what I'm talking about. Actually, there is a there is a group here in Portsmouth. The sister who was the number one initi initiated for Juneteenth long before it caught on, oh. she has a group that does steel bands. They're real good. What What's her name? My grandson played in one in Boston. Did everybody? Yeah, I see it. What's her name? Cherry Bailey? I was driving by, uh, <coughs> I think it's right down the road here. On Church Street, just after Church Street, I saw it. They have the, like a little. A little open air, open place that mm -hmm. they used to have a steel band. I see a steel steel band guy mm -hmm. practicing there. Not, 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 I see the panzo, so I know that somebody is practicing there. Right. But uh, yes, sir. So I was going back to you said your father brought you to the. Uh, oh, you want to hear that? Yeah, I want to hear that part. You skip. <laughs> you skip something. Right? I have to skip some. Of I already. You know, I heard the stories. So I know yeah. you skip some. <laughs> well. <laughs> I'm going to get to that. You're encouraging me. I'm going to get to that. Anyway, 1970, my father came home from work and asked me if I want to go hear the guys talk. So I never heard talk like that before. So I went to But I didn't go to, as I said, I didn't go because I want to learn that stuff. I went because of the fact that I wasn't allowed to go out on the street after, after it get dark. And that was the perfect time to go out on the street. Because I was my father, he can't say nothing no more. You know, so we out on the street, we hanging out. So we listened to the conversation, but that day changed my life forever. You know, that day, that day, that make a, a huge impact in my life. You know, so it was so the, the impact was so huge that it got me arrested eventually. You know what I'm saying? Who was the speaker? Huh? Who was the speakers? The speaker was a brother named, one of the brothers was a brother they called Geddes Granger. Uh, he later changed his name to Makandal Gaga. Another brother was uh, Dave Dabro. He later changed his name to um, uh, Cameron. And they're the first people, that they went on eventually to form an entire uh, organization called NJAC, National Joint Action Committee. And um, that, period in time was very uh, turbulent, I would say. Th those days were like extremely turbulent. Uh, on the 21st of April, the government uh, called for a state of emergency because we couldn't handle the demonstrations. And these people organized a massive march to go into the city. And the, the march was so big that you know they couldn't contain it. It was demonstrators all over the place with placards and, you know. And some guys um, decided to go rob some store. Uh, not, uh, not, not that they were black oriented, but some black, some black man, you know, but they wasn't really black oriented. They were like robbery oriented, they, you know, they were like, we got to take this stuff. We got to do this stuff. But one of the brothers who was with, we were in, in, in the mountains, he was he was around them, he made them, those days he used to travel armed all the time, so he made them put, put you know, put all everything back and said, that's not what we're about. You know, we're not here to rob nobody, and you know what I'm saying? This is not, this is about bigger issues than robbing some, some little poor Chinese guy. You know what I'm saying? So, then another guy, another brother got killed by the police, and that kind of sparked off a lot of, a lot of stuff, you know. I wouldn't go into detail about the stuff that happened there. It's a brother by the name of Basil Davis. A lot of stuff happened around his death, you know. It's, it's like the biggest, one of the biggest funerals the country ever saw. They had some bigger ones after that, mm -hmm. but that that was the first of its kind of that kind. You know, he, he was like nobody knew who he was. Only the few people that who probably personal to him knew him and so. But that whole event in 1970 sparked a lot of interest. That's how dangerous it was and how, how disgruntled the people of the country was. It was everybody, was everybody. Like, there was 
very few people who were siding with the government. You know what I'm saying? Very few people were siding with the government. Yes. So if nobody knew who he was, how did he get such a big share? Word spread because because of the situation. What it, I mean, nobody like regular people knew who he who he what's his contribution. It's just the people who was personal to him, who knew of him, spread the word like you know, and because of the situation in the country, with the with the disgruntledness that the people had for the government, and seeing that he got killed, in a in a. They blamed the government then, so everybody was like, yeah, we got to support this. I don't know if, that, if that's what they said, but they're like, we got to support this. So that's why they turned out in their large numbers. In large, large numbers, they turned out, and they just flooded the place, you know. But apart from that, um, so that sparked off a lot of stuff, and NJAC was operational at the time. They started to form themselves into an organization. You see, they had a, they had a lot of people. I can't remember them by name. I know some of them, but I can't remember some of their name because they changed their name along the way. You know, uh, we had. You keep saying people change their name. Did they change their name because of a spiritual awakening, or they just changed their name just because they? Well, it was a cultural thing, really. With a lot of the African brothers who was there, they chat change. I mean, with the Indian brothers too, it's like, but they didn't have to change their name, so to speak, because they already had their name. That they maintained from their culture. Oh, okay. The African brothers started to change their name. The sisters also started changing their names to African names. It was a, like a cultural awakening, you know. Mm -hmm. Everybody started wearing dashiki and sandals and you know beads on their hands. It come right out of the sixties. You see, it come right out of the sixties. And what bring it out? What, why bring it? What bring it out of that was in Canada in the sixties, in the late sixties, um, a group of West Indian students took over the, the, um, a room, I think it was a computer lab at the George Williams University in Toronto. And they made a big scene and you know, <coughs> the government had to get, the government from Trinidad and some of the other islands had to get involved and had them get them freed and brought them, they got deported eventually. So they all came back with that ideology that they had, you know, because at that time too, you had um, the stuff that was going on in the United States with the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. Sophie Carmichael, all, you know, all of them. But you had all that going on over here. They remained, it's like the 60s was a, was a time for that. You had the Vietnam War going on. You had, you know, blackness was taking a, a front seat now. It was not no longer on the back burner. People start waking up and wanting their, their, their civil rights. Where's Sophie Carmichael from? Trinidad. Mm -hmm. You know that. <laughs> How do I know that from you? That's no, like, he's from, he, he was banned in 1970 for coming into Trinidad. He was the government banned him. They just landed. They put him on the plane right back and sent him back to the states because he was so big over here. I mean, the guy was the president of the Black Panther movement, so they didn't want him to influence the the, the brothers in Trinidad. You see what I'm saying? So, do you have a question? Mm -hmm. Uh, and I was just asking about NJAC. Uh, now, are they an indigenous, this is an indigenous group, did they uh, become discontent because of the situations there? Were they influenced well, by... Well, before they became NJAC, I would say they're indigenous because uh, they, it was just African and Indian brothers. I mean, their struggle was it was it from the conditions in Trinidad, yeah. or were they influenced by what was happening here? And it was partly so, partly by here. Well, we see the same conditions there, yeah. so you find that instead of they they didn't address the conditions that were over here, they addressed our situation. Mm -hmm. you, you see, so thank you. Um, Oh, and, 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 Jack, and, and Jack later took the name National Joint Action Committee, mm. out of which the National United Freedom Fighters were, which is the organization I was in. Mm. So, but we were a little more radical than you know, they were. They were radical, but yeah, yeah. they were more into like the, the, 
culture, you know, the cultural part of, of it, you know, and, and uh, but anyway, we'll get to that. Um, there was, a, there was a, a bunch of different organizations, as I said, and unions around the place, a bunch of them. Different student bodies, different, uh, uh, different newspapers. Everybody was involved in one way or the other. Everybody was complaining about what the government was doing. They did not like the fact that, I think sometimes, I sometimes think that some of that was due to a bit of impatience. Because, um, you think? Huh? You think? <laughs> yeah, well, it was due to a bit of impatience because we had just gotten independence in 1962. So we were nowhere near, you know, in a position to negotiate for anything because the oil companies were still there. They, were, they didn't leave yet. You know, by and by they would have left eventually. But apart from that, we were going, they had their negotiations, they had their, their under, the, under the table <coughs> payouts and whatever have you, and people start taking sides. And, you know, the, the usual corruption that's going when you have a lot of money in a, in, in, in a country. The usual cor corruption that, that go on, you, you know what I'm talking about. They were involved in the same thing. You know? People making deals with this one and making deals with that one. And, you know, it, it starts to show, it starts spilling out on the sides. Well, how come you're getting all this money? What happened to the rest of us? Because at one point, Trinidad was richer than uh, 16 states in America. Their gross annual income was uh, several billion dollars. We had um, opportunities presented to us, but under the guise of um, so, like social programs that nobody found uh, interesting, I would say. The, the government had a, to ease the pressure, what they did was they had a program like this, they'll give you work for 10 days. It was called a Prime Minister's um, Specials something, you know, and, uh, I can't remember what it was. Uh, they would give you like 10, they would give everybody like 10 days. You could, you could go back and work multiple <coughs> 10 days, you know. And uh, <coughs> they thought that would uh, ease the situation, but people, people needed permanent, permanent jobs, permanent housing, you know what I'm saying? They, they needed permanent food. They need to know that they can take take care of their families. They needed to know all of that with those things. So that led to one thing, one person being disgruntled, then two people, three people, and then a multitude of people being disgruntled by all, whatever. Then people used to find the smallest of things to be good. Blame it on the government, you know. Blame it on the government. Blame it on the government. They they responsible. Because at that point, we're so laid in the mind, we're so, our minds have been taken over so long that we become so complacent that everything, we, we elect a government body and say, well, you have to take care of us, kind of attitude, you know. Not realizing, well, we have to take care of the government. We are the government. So that was all was uh, NJAC and NUF was trying to do, like, show the people that, look, you are the government. These are our employees. We don't have to do what they say. They have to do what we say. It's like any, any country you go to. The people become so dependent on the government because they keep pumping all these special programs at you. Even in America, they do it. They do it in every country because that's a strategy that they use in order to control people. When you think you have, they'll give you an inch of control. They'll give you an inch of control, <clears throat> but they take a foot for themselves. They control that inch within that foot. So you don't really have no control. You think you do, but it's an illusion. You don't know that you have, you could, you could have that. So that's why you have things like um, revolutions and stuff like that. That's why you have like in Cuba, Castro and Che Guevara take over Cuba. Right? Mao Zedong take over China, and whoever, uh, Kim Il Sung take over Vietnam, and everybody's, and these guys are all educated in the States. You know what I'm saying? They're all educated over here. So you teach them to take over the, your stuff. 
because they need to make it their stuff. So they have to figure out a way to make it. So we were trying to figure out the same, how to make it our stuff. How do we get rid of these people? So the only thing we can come up with is to keep pushing. Keep pushing until we push them to the water's edge. And they get on their boats and go back to America. That was, that was the, you know, you keep, you keep pushing, no matter how much of us die. We'll push and we'll push and we'll push and we'll push until the last of you leave. Nowadays they start coming back in their little, little droves, you know, and they're taking up residence. And there's, there's, because the country is like run by black people, it's run by black and brown people, it's run by Trinidadians. But these Trinidadians that it's run by, they're only black outside and brown outside, but their mind is totally <laughs> colonial. It, 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 it's, it's like, a, it's, it's, I, I don't want to say the word white, you know, because that's what it is. They have a white mind and a black body, you know. And it's going to get worse because nobody ain't going to take that for so long. But they, they, they have to, that's why we keep telling our story as much as we can, whenever, whenever we can, wherever we, wherever we go, we keep this truth. But when the last of us die out, ain't nobody going to be able to tell it no more. It's going to be recorded in the history books. But they're trying their best to wipe my generation out of the history books. <clears throat> so my question is, how did those other countries, including uh, Trinidad, become um, an armed struggle? How did it come from marching and preaching and uh, <clears throat> protesting to we're going to physically fight them? How, I mean it in juxtaposition to America, mm. where <clears throat> we had I don't know if it was, I can't say if it was worse. I mean, people were literally water hosing us and things like that, and it, it never trans, it, it never turned into a physical altercation between uh, African Americans and the, and the government. But it did in small pockets, though. Mm -hmm. You have to understand, it did in small pockets. You had the, the, the move in Philadelphia, right? You had uh, people like Asada Sokoro. And pe individual people and mm -hmm. individual little splinter groups try to do that. But America is such a large country. Mm -hmm. To organize an, 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 the American people into a revolutionary movement, is, that's a task. And I don't think people want to engage in that right now because, first of all, the U.S. government has superior weapons. What, you, what, what are you going to have? You can get access to those weapons as well. But most people that don't want to do that in America because they, they would rather talk about being black and being racism and whatever. They would rather, because they become so complacent with the treatment that they forget it. They, 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 you know what they're like to me? They're like, they're like little poodles that, that you train. You train a poodle, you train a little, a little um, dog, so you, 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 you can do whatever you want, do you, you, you understand? But in the islands, it's a little bit different. And the reason for that is, uh, I think, um, I just, I'm just speaking off the top of my head. I'm not, this is not something I researched, but based on experience, it's taught me that um, we have, uh, so-called black governments in the, in, in the Caribbean, right? We have, um, <coughs> we don't want to be under nobody's thumb, you know? We don't want to do that because we, we've, we've shown that already, that we're not, we don't, we're not gonna be under your thumb. We're gonna fight you if, if necessary. And a lot of people tend to live like that still today. They might be few in number, but the go as I said, the government releases all these um, programs on you, and, and have the kids not thinking about that. You see, you now the government is involved in a lot of crime and violence, and they have the, they have the youngsters thinking thinking that that's a government 
problem, but the governments are the ones inviting gang warfare, for instance. Yeah, the governments know the, you know how much uh, times they try to have talks about gang warfare in Trinidad? I think the people get tired of it. It's, you know, every day is a murder. Every day, we, I think we're the murder capital of the world right now, you know, because we already had uh, two, three hundred murders for the, and the year only just started. Last year we had 500 and something murders for the year. I mean, every year it's going on like that, you know. Every year it's people getting like so frustrated. They had like, these guys would go out and kidnap people just for a few dollars. They would go rob a place and get like $20 and kill somebody, you know what I'm saying? And, and the police commissioner is a woman. Not that anything wrong with that, but she's like, we need God. We probably do. But not everybody want to hear that. You, you understand? The general population don't want to hear that. They want a police commissioner who will do something about the situation. You know, we had, we had, um, uh, she's on, on a, a, like, on contract. They had, they had brought in, like, in the last, <laughs> Four years or five years, they had so many police commissioners in the country. It's unbelievable. Nobody wants to just like want the job, you know. I, I don't know if I don't know what the, what that's what, what that story is, you know. The the, 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 op, the the opposition party is like they're someplace else thinking about something else. What kind of gun laws do they have there? You can't buy a gun over there. If you're, the only way you can get a gun, you have to be a businessman. And still they have that much crime. Yeah. Right. Still they have that much crime. So they got a black market. Of black course, market. we have cocaine. That's where they get them. <laughs> so, <laughs> six hundred. You said all those murders, and they are gut from mostly from guns. Mostly from guns. And you can't get guns. <laughs> you can't get a gun license. Can't get a gun license. No. Uh, that's the funny part about it. People, are, them, 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 them youths down there, they don't. They don't really care about the government and they, we can't get a gun. We, we have guns. Oh, yeah. They have better guns than the police. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? These guys running around with AK 47s and flashing it in the street. You know what I'm saying? Broad daylight. It have no time limit on the thing. It's like anytime it is, is dying time. You know, that's, that's, I don't know what it is. I, I think these youngsters just, I don't know. I, I really can't explain. Is there many predominantly black colleges over there? Predominantly black colleges. We have the University of the West Indies. We have the University of Trinidad and Tobago. They're all predominantly black. What is the question? Yeah, this one in, was, you know, yeah, was they, they the college that developed. All the, all, the, all the colleges down there, all the schools are predominantly Indian and African. Uh, they have a couple of um, religious schools. The Trinidad Muslim League have a school. They have a college. They have, um, they have, um, and they just opened a new one here a few years ago. What's it called? Um, Darul Uloom. That's a Muslim, a Muslim uh, And they have Hindu colleges. You know, they have a bunch of, uh, but most of them is um, Indian and African or related. What's the population here? The population right now? Mm -hmm. uh, last time I checked, it was 1.2 million living on the island and probably half a million outside and divided between the rest of the world. I, I don't know if, if they have any. Uh, but we make babies just like anybody else. <laughs> we make babies just as much as everybody else. I was just wondering, just with the, when you're talking about how many uh, murders and all the violence there, just how many people were there, could that you know, speak to it? When I was in uh, Mali, they were they couldn't get guns also, but in northern Mali, the young people had guns, and they said uh, the the guys that I was with was saying that the French government, when they kicked them out, they gave them guns. Yeah. So they're causing all that havoc. In, in well, northern Africa. you see, that's that's um, that's what they did to start to start anyway. They did that from the beginning. From the time they landed in Africa, that's what they were doing. Was, Blind yeah. and conquer. Right. It's, that's that's a that's a trick of theirs, and we don't we haven't realized it. It's, we talk about it, but we haven't realized it. We haven't realized that that's what they do. 
You see, because they're always finding some little, they're always finding you in some little lie. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? They're always finding somebody in some little lie that they can tell you. You see? You see what he's doing? You know what I'm saying? So it's like you win, you lose, you lose, you win. It's, it's kind of like you do, you die, you lose. You, you don't, you die. They need, they need to keep a tight control. And the only way you can keep a tight control is by letting out a little pressure from the system sometimes. So when the, the pressure is eased up a little bit, you go back to being, because things are easy up, they make something a little easier for you to get. Eventually that's all going to go away. See, that's, that's not going to be around for too much longer. You know, that, that people are not going to continue living like that. You know. Do you have a question? Yes. Uh, uh, it's a 40 year, your point about Starbucks and the coffee, <clears throat> you know, the history tells us that Ethiopia was where, where, where the first coffee came from. That's what they wanted one point, At one point, they had that uh, Ethiopian one was the first coffee, actually, one to give, mm. give the world coffee. Now, <clears throat> the coffee franchise that I bought into was the only minority company here in America that could contract with Jamaica's Blue Mountain Coffee. Uh -huh. Like Trinidad uh, didn't hold the line as long as Jamaica did. Jamaica won't even allow Starbucks to sell their coffee. Right. The Blue Mountain Coffee. But they allowed our company, so I bought into this franchise that allowed to sell the Blue Mountain Coffee. Uh -huh. It is good coffee. But as far as coffee goes, uh, <laughs> maybe Ethiopia has something to do with it. I'm not saying they don't. Mm -hmm. um, but I also understand that, I don't know who shared what, but I've seen footage somewhere where the Arabians were Yemen. trading in coffee, Yemen. Mm -hmm. But, Yemen used to be a part of Ethiopia. Of Ethiopia. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's why they, they, they claim the Queen of Sheba, the history with the Queen of Sheba and all of that. That's why Yemen could, could claim that, because she was used to live over there. <laughs> And then migrate over the water to Aksum. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? And that's why uh, they, they say, the story goes, they say that Makeda, was what's her name, yeah. she had a son with King Solomon. That's what they say, yeah. Huh? That's what they say. All right, I'm, I'm just saying what they say. I, I, don't, I don't know that it's true or, or not true. Right, right, right. But, Makeda had a son for King Solomon. His name was Menelik, right? Mm -hmm. And it is said by the, by the by the Ethiopians in the in the book they they had a book that traces all the kings of Ethiopia that says Menelik looked exactly like his father. He was just as strong, just as pretty, just as handsome as his father. So in the marketplace, people would hail him as King Solomon. Oh. And that's how Ethiopia could claim the, the, that's the story from which Ethiopia claimed the Ark of the Covenant in the Bible that you read about, mm -hmm. right? That's how they claim it. They say when Menelik went to visit his father in Jerusalem, uh, one high priest, what's his name again? Zadok. They stole, now this is the words that the, the, the story used, they stole the Ark of the Covenant from Solomon and brought it to Ethiopia. You see, it's housed in Ethiopia, that's what they say. Nobody's seen it. Right. There's one there's one uh, priest that looks after it. It's well fortified, you know what I'm saying? But anyway, that's as far as the story goes. Uh, the name Menelik means son of the wise. But in Arabia, in, 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 in Jerusalem, he was known as Ibn Hakim, which also means son of the wise. Mm -hmm. And then we had Menelik II, you see, which is the lineage that Haile Selassie came from. That's why Haile Selassie is claiming to be the 225th descendant of King Solomon. I don't know how true it is, or which is a lie, or which is truth, or which is even made up story. <coughs> but that is the historical evidence they presented. But getting back to the coffee, like I was saying, uh, Yemen had claimed 
coffee came from from there and went to Ethiopia with the merchants, right? Uh, I don't know if I believe that or not, but I'm kind of in between it because I also know that Ethiopia grows a lot of coffee. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that if they originally was the original growers or the second in the, in, you, you understand? So whatever it is I'm saying, well, it's what I've read. Yeah, right, uh, we all know that the research right. said the African Ethiopians were the first to give coffee to them, not Muslims. Right. I mean that could that could have its roots in in in, in uh, um, diasporic kind of uh, uh, fame and fortune and fame because seeing that um, Africans I don't know invented everything I don't think they invented everything what I do know however is that. In Egypt, when Egypt was at the height of its uh, civilization, they had stuff coming out of it. It was like information, education, whatever from, you, 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 you understand what I'm saying? So I don't know, I mean, you, you, even if um, Pharaoh was a, was, a, was a bad man and killing off people, I don't think you can blame the whole of Egypt for that. Mm. That was his thing. You see what he had? And I don't even believe the Jews who was under the ones that most are free. I don't believe they were white skinned people anyway. Mm -hmm. I believe they were black Jews. They were black, they were dark skinned. Because there was no really white skinned people in in Egypt. <coughs> so because Isa went to, with his with, with his mother to hide in Egypt, same thing with Moses. That's what that's what the, the Bible stories are. I don't know how true it is or you see what I'm saying? So it's 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 all confusing in, in, in up to a point, but uh, I think I'm straying off the conversation. from Trinidad to Moses, to Egypt. It's just too far, man. You guys ask me questions. We talking about coffee. That's why I got that's just support of your 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 comments about coffee. I was just saying. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Trinidad now, let's go, back, let's go back to the to the conversation. Trinidad during the year, during the years, where was it, 1970? 1970 was uh, a year like any other year, but we had disturbances, you know, in, in the country. The entire country, this is not like one little village, or, or two little villages, this was the entire country. Every place in the country was in uproar because people are just, we had just gotten independence. We're still in that colonial frame of mind. You understand? We we were still uh, using English money. Like we used to have a big penny like this, David, a big copper penny like this, and the central the cent pieces were big, it was big as this. We had um, we had a shilling, or we used to call it. It was twenty five cents. We used to call it a shilling, and we had a. We had just gotten rid of the pound and the farthing and all of that. Well, that was English money. So we just had printed the first set of money of our own currency. We printed the own currency. Not that Trinidad can print money. They're not, they're not authorized. Nobody's authorized to print money but the white man. So, <laughs> you know. When 1970 came around, uh, the government put out a state of emergency, April 21st, 1970. And people, people just went uh, uh, haywire after that. Just went, we're not taking no currency. You know, we don't. We can't bring no currency here. So things start tumbling down and falling down, burning down, breaking down, mysteriously. You know, mysteriously, I, I yeah. Say mysteriously, because I don't know who did it. <laughs> I have no knowledge of who did it. I would say mysteriously, the building start burning, uh, and the people are fighting about the way I use that is. Is the people like that? You know, we, I'm telling you, we are all grandchildren of revolutionary. We do our grandparents uh, fought for equality and betterment and that kind of thing. It was not uh, racial. It was not on. It was not about race. It was always about workers' rights. So we kind of grew up with that workers' rights. So what 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 do the workers get? You see, so because there was a policeman in 1937. 
we call that little junction Charlie King Corner, right? Charlie King was a was a policeman who that the people of the village were so fed up with him because he used to like take advantage of the people. He would he was a black man then. He used to take advantage of the people and do them all kinds of things. And they chased him one day up into this hardware store. And it's a really tall building, probably 30 feet or something. And he he jumped from the window mm. onto the ground, mm. broke his leg, and they come outside and light him on fire and burn him to death. Or whatever, you know what I mean? mm. So that's the, the nature of the people that we do. They're not taking no, no nothing from you. You you got to give us what we want. So 1970 was the same kind of thing. Uh, buildings start, as I said, buildings start burning down. Just chaos all over the place, you know, chaos, pure chaos. So you have to like, I mean, when I was like 14, that's when they brought the state of emergency in. We used to go out on the street after six just to do damage, you know. The young kids, I'm talking, I'm 14, the oldest one probably was 13, and the youngest was 13 or 12. But because the oldest was probably 17, 18, tops. We did all kinds of just to harass the police, and it wasn't for no political reason. It was more for it was like a fun thing, you know. We terrorized the police; they terrorized us. You know, you know what I'm saying? And it was like a joke. We would do things to make them come chase us. The real stuff didn't start until 1972. All through '71, we start thinking differently. We start reading. We start having secret meetings all over the place. The same young kids, these same young kids, we, I was just 15. Mm. Other brothers were like 17, 18. The oldest one of me was probably 19 tops. So I, I don't think anyone was older than that. Um, we started to read every political book we could find, anti-government book. We read Che Guevara, we read Fidel Castro, we read Mao Zedong, we read everybody. We could, could read everybody. But a lot of the kids that I grew up with, they couldn't read really good. So they elect, frequently elected me because I could read two words better than they, they can. And I used to struggle to read in some of them books where the words are so big. I, I didn't even know what the meaning of dogma is until I get older. I started to realize, oh, wait a minute, I know this word. You know what I'm saying? Like little words I couldn't tell the, the meaning of because I, but I read it. I read them and uh, I didn't know what they meant. I remember printing a, a T-shirt say "Revolution is the only solution" and spray paint and wearing it all over the place, proud. And one of my one of my good friends I say, "You want to get beat up by the police, man? Keep wearing that shirt." I said, "They can't do nothing." The next day, <laughs> <laughs> the next day, I walking down the road and this jeep, this police jeep, stop on the side of me, and I say, "Hey, come, come." What do you have on the front of your shirt there? So that's good. So they throw him in the van, you know. They throw me in the van. From my reach in the van, they start pounding me till I reach the police station. <laughs> <laughs> like, they didn't even charge me and they make me take off my shirt mm. and walk up the road there back, you know. I'm like, oh, these people are wicked, yeah. Anyway, that, that come and pass until other stuff happened after that, you know, other stuff happened. But uh, then everybody started to want me to do that. Like spray paint a shirt with a with a, so then the whole village started when you know, I said I, I, and I do it. I was doing it for free, you know. I could have made money off of it. <laughs> I'm telling you, I could have made money off of that. But anyway, I, I didn't make no money. So that come and went a little. That's 1971. 72. Things got a little more serious. You know what I'm saying? And Jack start having, it's starting to break up because there was, that was when Nuff was starting to form. Nuff was a military organization. And we believe that there's only one way to stop this. It's by two arms, you know. That's the only way to do this is to arm yourself and go fight them. So that, you know, a little bit of pulling and tugging went on. You know, when you're separating something, a little bit of pulling here, 
and some people's ideology was different, and some was kind of different again, and some was on something weird, something else. You know what I'm saying? But not itself separated with a, a about three or four brothers. They went on their own, and you know, a couple of them was armed. Um, Brian Jeffers, he was armed. Uh, brother named uh, Guy here, he was. He was a university student at the time, and uh, there was a you know they influenced other people, you know by speaking. They had a couple of blocks in the city, the one like block five and block six, where most of the revolutionary stuff was happening, and they was doing little little things here and there, you know. And um, but the night it really kicked off in in Port of Spain, it was uh, I think. The story goes, a guy was going up the street, and the police stopped, and he was armed, and he just started shooting at them, and that was it. That, the knock was kind of born after that, you know? And uh, those brothers leave the city, and it well, was about five or six of them, and they come down to my area where we were from. One of them, um, he is from that area, Malcolm, he is from that. The brother you send the books to, mm -hmm. he's from that area. So he was, he was, he come down to our area. So he originally is from down there. And uh, then the other brothers followed him. And uh, they had a, um, they were staying in, a, in, a, in, some, in some jungle, a little bit south of the village, the next village over. Because it was real, a real jungleish area. Where I'm from is really, you, you go right, here yeah, the jungle starts right there, you know. So they they liberated some uh, firearms from the estate police. Liberated? Yeah. And we we don't steal. Really? I've never stole a thing in my life. I've liberated stuff, but I've never <laughs> stole. <anything. laughs> no, I'm serious, man. I never stole nothing in my life. Not even not for personal gain. None of it was for personal gain, it was liberation. That's what we were doing. So they, they did that. There was about probably seven or eight of them, you know. And uh, they went, in, went back in the jungle. And the next day, the day after, we, we weren't on, on the run yet. We, weren't, we didn't go in the bush yet. We, we were outside, operating outside, in, in urban, you know. That's we divided into two. And rural, the rural brothers and the urban brothers, you know. So, but the urban brothers was much larger. Nobody was allowed to go. We used to say, "Well, you, you trip in the bush when you go in the bush," but nobody was just allowed to pick up and go in the bush. You, know? you, you understand? You have you have to become so heated outside first, and you have to become so well known by the people because you still have a, a bil the ability to operate without them knowing you, which is what we was doing. And anyways, that, that next day, the next day, uh, I can't remember the exact day of the week it was, but so I don't think I ever seen so much police and soldiers in my life. They were just filing in the in the village with, with trucks upon trucks upon trucks, you know, looking for these guys. And they set up camp in a place called Apex, which is part of British Petroleum. They set up the, the, the military camp down there. <coughs> And they start spanning out in the village, you know, searching house to house and, you know, searching everywhere. You know, everywhere you could think about this, they were searching. Every place they you could think about, they searched it. There's not a, they didn't leave a, a blade of grass rough or unruffled. They didn't, every stone, they lift up every little stone. I'm serious. This is not, this is not no joke. This is like serious. They, you standing right there watching them watching them search little things and they want to like search you. I just like search so many times, I lost count, you know, it's like, if I come in here to say, hey, you know you're going to get searched. You, you, you're going to get in your pocket. So you you have to make sure you don't, in them days we were smoking weed, right? So everybody had weed on them. Mm -hmm. And it, like, it's like, you gotta hide it. You gotta hide everything. You hide, you know, any little piece of paper with anything revolutionary on it. 
you, you make sure it's secure. Anything with, with books, any kind of thing like that, you got to make sure it's secure. We used to have books in the, in the bush. When we have meetings, then we go there and take it out, and you know what I'm saying? We wrap up in plastic. You know, and we, we used to go there and read it. Um, so anyway, uh, after that scene play and the common, the, the, the police establish pretty much a permanent camp in Tiger Hall. Pretty, they're pretty much permanent, they, they, so they can be on call at any given moment. They can, you know what I'm saying? So um, then, soon after that, and that's that same day, the day they they, they they come down there, they they meet up with those those brothers, and a, a little some little shootout takes place in the bush. One brother get captured, uh, and then everybody kind of disperse, and you know, they separate ways for a little while, and they still think things calm down. But what they didn't realize was that Faisabad itself spawned a lot of revolutionaries in that time. People who were grandchildren of the 1937 revolutionaries. They didn't, they didn't, um, they didn't bargain for that. They, didn't, they, they thought it was just an isolated thing. But then, so these brothers left the area and went back to, to Port of Spain. But stuff was still happening in Faisabad long after. So they realized some they had an, we had another unit down there another set like you call it a cellar unit whatever. So there was brothers down there because the brothers from the city find that the brothers from there were much more susceptible and easier to get along with as from a revolutionary point of view. You see what I'm saying? So there was there wasn't no infighting. There was no who's better than who's not. You, you understand? There was, so these brothers here found it to be like conducive to what they were doing. So <coughs> then a lot of the brothers from there was going to, to the city and in, in between. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what was the, the the people who were not involved in it, like the other people in the village, the the you know. Everyone else who lived there, because I remember, <clears throat> excuse me, there was a story of. Um, I mean, it was it was understood that the people living there knew who was who, right? Yeah. And they would uh, basically have the back of the yeah. people who were. Well, everybody in that village knew something. Something was going on, and everybody knew that these guys were either their kids are involved. Or they know somebody's involved. They, 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 we all grew up around them, so they knew who we were. You know what I'm saying? Because I remember uh, there's this little block that we used to hang out on. I wrote some poetry about that. It's called Under the Mango Tree. We used to gather under this mango tree and play drums and whatever. And I remember one day the police come to the place and everybody just disappeared, dispersed. You know. Because it, there, there was no road, there was a little dirt track going up a hill. So always somebody at the bottom of the hill, some neighbor at the bottom of the hill, would send a message up there, you know, so the, the police were down the hill here. So if you all up there, they like move, you know. I remember one day they were searching houses, and when they're searching this one, we moved to this one. They would come to search this one and we would move someplace else. And it was just people's houses. It was no guerrilla camp or nothing. It was not, not a military camp. It was nothing like that. It was just somebody's house. Mm -hmm. But because they they knew us from before, prior to the to that time, they knew who we were. They knew my father, they knew my mother, they knew, you know what I mean? They knew my grandparents. So we we like one big happy family, let's say. Mm -hmm. One big family. It's like you can't come here and touch none of my children, kind of, kind of vibe, you know. So, because either your nephew involved, or your, your grandson involved, or your granddaughter involved, or something, you know. I mean, no, so they they gave up nobody. They they didn't give up anybody, and that was harassment for the police because they didn't because they they, they can't find no information. So where are these guys? A ghost? You know, nobody don't know nothing. 
how, how you could be operated and I mean I tell you we used to be on the street like almost every every evening we would come out from the bush and come on the street and be among the brothers on the street you know and uh, I remember one day we were hanging out on the corner, the same place I tell you about where the guy Charlie can get killed. We all hanging out there, you know, and talking to the brothers and you know having a big discussion. And somebody come up come up the street and said, the, the police are right down the road there, you all better like. He didn't even have to say nothing again. All he had to say is the police right down the road there. We would just we just cross the street and go behind these uh the oil field had some what they what they call a bungalow, you know, like little little cabin for the workers that used to live there. And we were right there. We was like, not even, we were like by the door. And I tell you what I see. There's a big drain right there. The police just reach there. All of them bail out the van and jump in the little drain. And you know, like, what they were looking for, I have no idea. Up till today, we don't know what they're looking for. Obviously, they're looking for us, but I don't know where, what they were looking for besides why would you sit on the drain and you, you, you're right here watching me? You know, it was... About how many was in your group like that? Um, at that point, there probably was about uh, 15 people. Did they ever get bigger? It got really big, but not on the people were not... As I said, people were not allowed to go into the bush just like that. It was big. It was big. It was hundreds of hundreds of others. But everybody was more operating in urban settings. You know, just, you know what I'm saying? Urban, it was, let me put it bluntly like this. It was ur ur urban warfare more than a rural warfare. Mm -hmm. But there was nobody to shoot at in the bush, really. We didn't shoot a tree. <laughs> No, everything is happening in, 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 in the urban. So you're saying in the bushes where you were hiding? Yeah. But in the, on, in the urban is where, yeah, the, where the fighting, fighting was going? Yeah, the fighting took place in, in, in urban areas, okay. you know, not in, not in the jungle area. They would come in the jungle and we would be in the urban. And they would be scouring the whole place and searching up everything. They may find a, 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 a food dump or something, you know what I'm saying? A supply dump somewhere. And but we took the most obvious places to hide them because they would walk right over it and you know. We know the area. We're from there. They're not. You see? I used to watch them walking, like crouching. And so what are you all crouching for? Ain't nobody around here to do you nothing. Know? I remember one morning uh, I didn't go in the bush yet. Um, my father come inside and say, um, boy, this is the most amount of police and soldiers I see. And hear me now. What, they come for me already like that? Just like that. And I wake up and I, I see one brother named uh, Lester Joseph and another one we call Freddie. Both of them on top of a hill by a, a mango tree that's scooping down the, because it's all, we live in really hilly areas. They, they were scooting down there, and the police with the dog and all kind of barking and noise and all, all kinds of drama going on. And then that guy's gone, you know, they're passing through people's yard, and the, but the police don't know. We know everybody, and everybody knows who we So the, 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 the people say, come, come, come this way, come this way. Pass him. You know what I'm saying? I, I watch a big old police dog barking as though the world coming to an end. And he's like, and the, the police were like, oh yeah, we find the trail. It's not a trail, it's just some dirty old chicken egg or something. He, 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 he come upon him and he was like, <gasps> you know, and the police were like, no, it's just some eggs. And so, they, you know, so the evening time come and them guys come back around, you know. And I go, I go uh, from my house, we, I went up the hill. I was there back and I had a, Short pants, a little short bathing suit, kind of trunk on. And I had a bucket in my hand with a 38 revolver in it. This police told me, Yeah, you come, come. So, you know, you, you know a guy named Robin? 
I said, yeah, I just leave him down the hill and just leave him in the house. And I, he, I crossed the street, and there's this uh, old teacher who ran a little kindergarten school, Miss Mabel. I said, Miss Mabel, give me some water to drink here. And she said, I don't want you. Then she turned her back and go inside to get me the water. So I just kind of scoot behind the house and go run over a, pig, a, a pig pen and, you know, some old... And I come up the street on the corner, and there's one sister in the street there. Um, her uncle was with us. He, he just died recently. He said, wait, 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 wait. She get, she, I'm going to get you a t-shirt. But the t-shirt she bring for me was like for her little brother. He was like this big, and it was so small. I like put, put it on, and I cross the street, and I, I go down. When I go down the hill, I met her uncle coming up the hill. And she said, oh, where are you running down to, man? Well, I just see the police stop in front of your house and they're talking to your brother. You know? And he just said, okay. But then he know that they don't know him. So he go up the hill, pass right in front of his house and say, hey, Miss Josephine. And that's what he called his mother. And she was like, okay. And he just walked down the hill and come back and meet me. You see? So we up on top of this, this, this next hill. And we're sitting there and we kind of contemplating what, what, what we should do because we know we can't head out in the, in the, in the, in, in, in the city, in, in the town. And I said, okay, well, there's one brother, my cousin, his name is Rance Mardi. He was across the main road on the other side of town. Not far, you know, just, just maybe a quarter of a mile away from him. So I said, I'm going to go over there and hang with him and, until, you know, Lincoln said, well, well I'm going to go over here and do this. So I, 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 got, I got over there, and I get over to see, I, I see Rance, and he was sitting on this chair, he had a, a, a 16 gauge shotgun across his, lap, his leg, and his niece was braiding his hair, you know, and uh, so he, he's like, what? so I tell him what's going on, he said, okay, let's, let's do, we'll deal with it later, when it get dark, you know, so when it got dark, we decided to cross the street back to the same side, that we just come from. And uh, we going up, there was a, 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 a safe house that the brothers would meet at, you know? And uh, that house get marked from a couple of years before. So we get there, and there's this one little house standing opposite it. It was low to the ground of this with, with a hill of in, in the middle. So we kind of lean on, 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 hide behind the, 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 the wall and looking over the street. Along comes this, um, and the, the police, you could know their vehicle, because they used to use them Land Rovers. And the Land Rovers, the headlights are like close together, right? Mm. Only two set of people use them, the oil field and the police. So we know it had to be one of them. So when we start, we see the blue, they use the, the, the blue, <clears throat> we see them go down, and Rance was like getting ready to like sh like shoot at them. So I said, no, no, you can't do that, man. You can bring those guys over there in the house. They they wouldn't know what's going on. So he he he, he back off and just they pass and they slow down and they look at the house and no activity in the house. So but them brothers was over there at the house, being quiet, you know. And, and they come out and then we all kind of get dispersed, you know. But apart from that, uh, 1970 brought along with it um, uh, people die in 1973 or 72, 74, 75. You know, there was one sister, I think I spoke about her uh, on Saturday, Beverly Jones. She, she was the sister of. Um, one other sister named Jennifer, who went on to become the Trinidad ambassador for Cuba. And uh, she, she, she got shot in her face and whatever, and she died. There's another brother, but two of them died the same day, you know? And, uh, but it, it took her death to uh, make the country aware that something was going on, and that was very serious. You see what I'm saying? Because nobody believes that when the, when the newspapers print a story on the paper, they would say, um, 
are we involved in a guerrilla warfare? Are we involved in this? Are we involved in that? But it didn't dawn on them that something was actually going on until that day. Mm. Her funeral was perhaps one of the biggest funerals in Trinidad I've ever seen. Mm. There were some other brothers that from my village got killed. Four of them died the same night. Was she pregnant? Yes, yeah, she was pregnant, actually. But um, uh, she she would she would um, I would say uh, but there were other sisters involved, you know, who who you know didn't die, but they did this. Some of them died now because they died of natural causes, and there's other sisters who was involved in liberating money and funds and whatever as as you um, you know one other question I don't know if you you might want to answer it or not I remember you told me a story about uh, you and a somebody identified you um one time or tried to identify you and then yeah. the witness said it wasn't you yeah that was some white guy I shoot at well, I, I tried to shoot at I, I, I should have said <coughs> shoot at him you know I, I don't know what happened but Anyway, some little, some little scene was taking place, and uh, we didn't know that he had, he was a paymaster for one of them uh, oil companies, and he just drove up on whoever was in front of him and, and shot their fire, and he just drove back. And they, they, uh, when they arrested me, they, they charged me for shooting at him. But he said it was a, a Negroish looking guy with a full face beard. I mean, I didn't even have a grain of hair on my face. You know, like I, I was clean. I was 18 years old. Man. I'm clean. I'm, I'm never. I've never shaved in my life. So he tried to sell that. Sell that to the jury, and the, and the judge was like so brutal. I would say he was like. I mean. When the lawyer asked him about his, um, asked the witness, if, if do you see the, the person in the court? He says, no, that is not him. That's when he said, well, it was a Negroish looking guy with a big beard. I don't have no big beard. I, I never had a beard. So the lawyer made a no case submission and the judge was, didn't uphold it. He was like, no, you want to do? you're going through with this trial. Something is not right here. <laughs> You're framing me up, that's okay, right? You know what I'm saying? Well, you see, uh, before the trial started, I was in the in the um, in the dock, and I asked the 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 court constable for a piece of paper because my lawyer wasn't there, and he gave me a piece of paper. But I know I just start drawing up on on paper like free all political prisoners and writing up all kinds of revolutionary slogans on it, and he saw. That, and he took it from me and he said, bring it to the judge. And the judge said, we'll deal with this after that government property you destroyed. You see what I'm saying? So they, they, they never really bothered with it. They were going to charge me for contempt of court. I was like, one second, let me look at this. Man. But eventually they, they came, the, 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 the jury only stayed out for like probably 15 minutes and came back with a not guilty version. You know, so I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what they were they were thinking anyway. So, um, but eventually, um, you know, I ended up with about fifty cases, you know, wow. and uh, all of which I I won, you know, because the police were stupid. You know, they they, <laughs> they was charging Tom for something that Harry did, and charging Harry for something that Dick did. You know what I'm saying? But they wasn't really sure. And they're getting all kind of conflicting stories from brothers who they arrested. Because it, it was like if we had planned that. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. They didn't, some, some of them was being really truthful too. You know what I'm saying? Some of these brothers were being truthful, but the police were sloppy. <laughs> they were sloppy in their, in their work ethic. They were sloppy in their investigation. They were, you know what I'm saying? So all in all, some of the brothers went to prison and did some time. There was um, uh, a couple of brothers, um, Andy Thomas and Kirkland Paul, they get uh, sentenced to death. Mm -hmm. and, um, I showed a picture of them on the, oh, yeah. on, on the, on the wall there. And, uh, 
there's a couple of brothers, um, one of them named Kenny Alexander, he, he was the one who got the biggest jail sentence when he did for 20 years. Mm -hmm. He did 99 years for all the, he plead guilty for all the cases he had and they had to give him the big, he had to do the biggest sentence, which was 20 years. He all pled guilty? Years. Yeah. Because they, they, what, what they had done was, he lost one of the case, mm -hmm. two of the cases, he got seven years mm -hmm. apiece. So he got, uh, so he said, you know what, I'm going to show you this time again. So mm -hmm. Call for all of them. But otherwise they would have given, if they had given him to run concurrently, he would have been still in jail. But he's been out of jail for like 20 years or something. When they, you, you say they arrested you a, a, quite a few <laughs> number of times, they caught you with weapons on you? Yeah. Yeah. The day I get arrested. So they, they, they didn't give them back to you, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you said many times, but, and then you said his guns won't, it was one no way you can get guns, and you a lot, lot of guns. <laughs> they arrest you with a prior, you don't see it. Uh -huh. And you don't see it again. You better go get another one. <laughs> That's the way it works. Tell me what you what, what would you do? You go say, Hey, Mr. Officer, can I have my gun back, please? <laughs> they would look at you like, What are you crazy? Mm -hmm. You know, I tried to do that legally and they still looked at me like I was crazy. I, no, I wasn't even gonna try I wasn't <coughs> even gonna try to do that. Right? I got it back, but it they went through a bunch of things. I went through a lot oh. of stuff to get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you you know, so not, he won't get that gun. I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna get that back. Right. Listen. When they arrested me, they charged me for possession of weed and ammunition, none of which I had. I had two bullets in the gun I had. Two bullets in the gun I had. And the, the one bullet they brought to the, to the court to charge me under was a 12-gauge was a shotgun bullet. You know what a 12-gauge shotgun yeah. bullet looks like, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you know what, a, what a, I had a... a you had, a, you had a pistol. Yeah, I had a pistol. <laughs> and, a, and a shot. And a, and it doesn't and a, look like that. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the policeman was like, uh, you know, whatever, whatever. And he said the first time he saw, he, he, he was the one who was arrested, who arrested me. And, uh, but he wasn't there. He just take up the case. They gave, the, the guys who arrested me gave him the case. So he come and say, um, First time he saw me was 12 o'clock in the day, but I get arrested like 7 o'clock in the morning. And uh, the lawyer that I had <coughs> was a uh, 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 SC, that's like state, uh, 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 like Queen's Council, QC was QC, Queen's Council. He, he advises the British Pri Privy Council, you know what I'm saying? He was my lawyer. And, uh, and he and was like 82 years old when he was, like, he was walking like, yeah, I'm serious. I was like, "Did you hear? Did you hear?" You look at that Then he called. He said, um, uh, you, "You want to see Sergeant Randy Pierre?" You know, that's his name. So Randy Pierre was like, uh, "What are you calling me that for?" You know, like, okay, well, you're gonna do this here. Um, you say that the first time you saw Mr. B. Pat was. 12 o'clock in the day. And he changed it. He said, no, 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 like 7 o'clock. Because he, then, he, then he remember what is already going on in the court record that he saw me at 12. Mm -hmm. So they dismissed that. And, you know. and the thing now is that the magistrate was like, say, um, you're free to go, sir. Watch me now. Mm -hmm. Come out of the dark and then put your hand in my pocket and I'm starting to walk outside the door. Right? I'm sorry, brother. You ain't coming in here. Uh, and then, uh, then in the back of me, I hear somebody say, "Oh no, 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 no! He has got more matches pending, you know." Mm -hmm. Magistrate, they're like, "They get that man, you know." Like, mm -hmm. like, a bunch of cops just jump on me. You know? uh, so that was uh, my. Uh, so, so you even left out of the courtroom? No, nah, I didn't even get to leave. Out of the but if I had left it, they wouldn't have seen me again. Wow. You know. So anyway, um, then after all that come and happen. Uh, you know, people die, people don't people, you know, whatever. The Privy Council bring um, Andy Thomas and uh, Kirkland Paul down from the condemned person. And they were free. Then uh, the three, three brothers, 
the one that lived till he was 17 at the time of when the when the, 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 the cup was given. Mm -hmm. So they, they gave him life. They gave, actually, they gave and him two. Seven, two yeah, 17? 17, yeah. They gave him two life sentences. And uh, the other, but the other was, two. But he was juvenile, all, juvenile right? 17. I didn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> he got married when he was 96. <laughs> juvenile? No, he wasn't no juvenile. He 17. Was but 17, he still would have been tried as an adult. He had yeah, been. but not, not for. They were not going to try any of us as juveniles. No? No. They're not going to like that. We're not juveniles. We're political prisoners. Yeah. We're prisoners of war. We're not no juveniles. We just not in trouble. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> or like they do here in the United States, everybody's in a gang. Yep. Anytime you do something wrong, you're in a gang. We're a different, we're a different, uh, we're different species of human beings. You see, the thing is, with us, it, they try to charge us on the um, banditry and criminal behavior. That's what they tried. It Bandage. didn't really work because we had powerful people on the outside. You know what I'm saying? We had people on the outside who were backing us. We had people involved in that movement, doctors and lawyers and whatever have you. And, you know, but they were all hoping that one day they would get a position if we happened to, to take over the government. You see, all, all of them had their eyes on something else. Mm -hmm. You see, because we, we had stuff, you know, we had things going on. Um, we had people in politics, you know what I'm saying? Um, but the brother Andy Thomas, in 1990, he had changed his name to Umar Wale Abdullah. He was a Muslim. They, he changed his name eventually. He, in 1990, July of 1990, the Jamaat al-Muslim took over the government and shot the prime minister. And uh, he was one of the leaders of the, the, the brother who was leading the Jamaat was a brother by the name of uh, Yassim Abu Bakr. So, and they got amnesty to that, general amnesty to everybody who was involved. But Andy Thomas, he, he, he died later on, you know, he died from some cancer or something. But Kirkland, I think, is still alive, still, still somewhere, has mm. said something in the world. You know what I'm saying? There's a, there's, a, there's a few brothers still alive. Most of them have died, either natural causes or, you know, no, no, none of them uh, died from vi violence. You know what I'm saying? Or anything violent or nothing like that. Um, so after 1990, then things start to change up a little bit. And they're still after the Jamaat, Yassim Abu Bakr, he died. He was not involved with us, but he was involved in his own thing. And his Jamaat would always would be at the forefront of uh, police raids and always in the news. You know what I'm saying? At uh, one point, uh, he, he had a, um, these are just rumors, I'm listening to what, the, what the, they read on the newspapers, that he was in, in cahoots with uh, um, Muammar Gaddafi, and he was involved with uh, people from the Middle East, whoever I, I read it over, I can't remember some of their names now, so. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, it, it's, uh, and that in a nutshell is my story, really. In a nutshell, it's a little bit bigger, but mm -hmm. <laughs> most of that I can discuss privately with you. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would not discuss that on camera. Right. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Yeah. All right, let me, let me make sure I turn everything off because I'm going to ask you something. <laughs> don't, don't, none of them cell phones can hear you. Oh, yeah. So never mind then. Huh? Taking no chances with it. Yeah, you wouldn't need to. <laughs> uh, did he get you those books? Huh? Did Malcolm get those books? No. He didn't? No. I told you I told you that if I if I had sent them to him one at a time, uh -huh. he would have probably get it. Mm -hmm. But in a big bulk like that, Malcolm Kernahan, no. Just because, because of his past? Uh, uh? Just because of his past.